he's got a dislocated wing. You can just see his left wing is sort of hunched, leaning forward, so the wing doesn't open properly. And the female, who's, what's she now, five? And of course, much, much smaller. Um, she had green stick fractures. Right, this is David Waters and I've just come down to visit him because we're exchanging a couple of guns. He's a firearms dealer and I had a couple of lovely Damascus off him, but his life is gone. He's taking them back off me for the moment and while I'm here, he's just introducing me to his pets and he'll explain to you just what these are and where they come from and what he's doing. Well, two great bustards here. Fergus is the name of the chap here. A long story with uh, why he's actually called Fergus. He was from the first year that I bought Great Busters back from Russia. Um, we did have, what with the benefit of hindsight, we know uh, uh, errors in the diet the birds were being fed in those days. Um, and he's actually got remarkably short legs and he's just quite a bit smaller um, than a normal Great Buster, but he's still a good sized bird. You can see his left wing, it's just hunched a little bit forward. Now he dislocated that when he was um, young. It doesn't cause him any pain or distress but it won't go back into the socket and that wing can't actually open. The female behind, because she's much much smaller, people know great bustards as being the heaviest flying bird in the world. There's another bit there in the record books, they've got the greatest sexual dimorphism and that's the difference in size between the males and the females. And the males can weigh up to five times the weight of the female. But she had a wing injury, um, and again the bones are healed and so on now, but the wing it sort of opens 90% but not 100%. She can fly but not perfectly and as such we really don't think she'd survive in the wild. So they're kept in the aviary here. Um, for the last three years we have had eggs off the, off the female and for the last two years we know they have mated. Um, but sadly those eggs have been infertile. Um, Why do you think that is David? Why are the eggs infertile? It's a difficult one. Inexperienced bird. Um, you can't show him how then. It, it's difficult to exactly <laughs> show, show him how it's done. Um, bustards are not a species that pair. You would normally have uh, a flock of adult males and a flock of females. And at the particular time of year, the males get together, they do this very, very elaborate display. They've got a pouch that runs down the front of the throat and they inflate that. They sort of turn themselves almost inside out to form this big white fluff ball. Um, and the successful males, a bit like a red deer har harring type system, the successful males will apparently mate with a lot of females. Um, and the males need this sort of competition with each other to, to perhaps get their full hormonal inputs working and, and so on. Um, but we do know of one or two other places in Europe that have got just a low number of birds and in time they have... Well, then hope they might. What do they violence. feed on in the wild and what do you feed them on here? Well in the wild, and they're real omnivores, um, through the winter months perhaps the favourite thing would be oilseed rape. They absolutely love that and because there's no shortage of that. In and the local place. farmers are happy with your busters running it over their rape, are they? Yeah, they, they actually the local farmers are just delighted to see the bustards. They love them. They, they do peck, they're not like geese, which will waddle and trample. And geese will actually do more damage through trampling the crop than, than eating it. Um, they like insects, um, they'll eat voles, mice, males, things up to the size of a rat really. Now in captivity, the, the basics of their diet, it's a, it's a good quality sort of pelleted bird food. Um, and they also enjoy mealworms. Um, yeah, thank you, Fergus. Um, and they get plenty of greenery and so on as well. But, uh, he will get more and more, well, let's say, badly behaved. <laughs> he can really get quite sort of um, resentful of any intrusion and so on. But yeah, generally he's um, 
he's quite benign. Uh, this sort of interaction, it's uh, well, at least the way we interpret it, it's welcome to the flock and I'm in charge, is the, the message he's giving. <laughs> Fine looking bird though, so hopefully we'll get them to breed in the future. How many yeah, birds have you got out? You've got to, I uh, won't say where this reserve is. Are the public able to see these birds at this reserve? Is it totally private? Yeah, no, with the reintroduction project, we've got uh, three reserves um, uh, up on, on around Salisbury Plain. There is one of them which we're able to take visitors to because it's partly in the Ministry of Defence training area and so on. Uh, we do need to make it uh, on a pre-arranged basis, but greatbusterd.org is our website, and all the details of visits are on there. Um, yeah, and we, we meet up, we just travel a little party, and bar a foggy morning, we can pretty much guarantee to find some bustards. Um, not at this sort of range, obviously, it's a binoculars and telescope job, but we can find them in the wild. Well, David, is there, is there anywhere else in, in Britain that's got these great bustards? Are you the only people? At the, at the moment, it's just in, in Wiltshire. Um, there are, without doubt, other places in the UK which could sustain great bustards. And the obvious one being Norfolk, and there's a great deal of enthusiasm there. And, and also Cambridgeshire. Wiltshire's very proud to have a, a great bustard on its coat of arms. But uh, Cambridgeshire has actually got two bustards. The bustards rampant, one either side of the castle, which is uh, quite a good looking uh, coat of arms. <laughs>